Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, I'm Cheryl Sisk. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Development in uh, NatSci, and I'm joined um, by uh, Gabe Ording, who is the director of the Center for Integrative Studies, uh, General Science. And I also want to mention that we have uh, Diana Bello de Ocampo here, um, uh, uh, who was um, also a part of the team that put together this presentation. So the uh, NATSI climate survey um, was um, sort of an outcome or a product of the NATSI task force on inclusive initiatives that uh, was launched in spring of 2018. And um, one of the recommendations from that task force was to conduct a climate survey, which was done. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, and then the list of six people there that you see on this um, on the first slide here are a, a subcommittee that uh, once the results of the climate survey were in, um, got together and put together this presentation. So just um, so that you know what uh, the the actual full report of the climate survey is quite long and there are, I don't know, upwards of 75 tables uh, or so of information. Uh, this committee um, selected and um, uh, certain aspects of the uh, data that we, we got from the survey um, to uh, present to the college um, college wide. And so it, uh, just a, a acknowledgement that, that what we're gonna be talking about today uh, reflects um, the thoughts of, of this uh, subcommittee on, on what were the most important things to highlight for, for folks in the college. And I want to draw your attention to the link in the lower left of this slide. This will take you um, directly to the uh, NATSI uh, Climate Survey full report. And that full report um, uh, we'll have everything, obviously, uh, beyond what we present here today, but it also has unit level uh, data. Um, and so if there were sufficient responses from uh, a particular unit, uh, so as to, you know, not um, uh, identify be, be identif for individuals to be identified, then there are uh, unit level data for units to take a look at, reflect on, and um, think about within the unit. And we'll, we'll come back to that at the very end of this presentation. So I think, uh, Gabe, ready for the next slide. So the uh, survey was administered in a basically spring semester of 2019. So um, bear in mind now that, well, what are we approaching, 2022? Uh, so the, the data are a few years old now, but nevertheless, um, help us have helped us to establish a baseline for what the climate was like and what how people perceive the climate and culture in the college uh, back in spring 2019 and um, definitely uh, highlights areas that for us um, to improve and areas that we um, can um, should should work on. So a little bit about the survey itself. There were five versions of the survey that were sent out to five different groups of, of respondents. Um, one version was sent out to faculty and this group included um, uh, fixed term uh, tenure system faculty and uh, specialists who have teaching responsibilities. Then uh, the second version of the survey went to support staff and specialists with um, uh, responsibilities in the areas of advising outreach curriculum development and to postdocs. Uh, graduate students got a third version of the survey. Uh, NatSci majors, undergraduate majors, uh, got a, their own version. And then the fifth version was um, what we call other undergraduates. And these included uh, our Lyman Briggs coordinate majors, and then a random sample of um, undergraduate students who had taken at least uh, one NatSci course in spring or fall of 2018. Right. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows you the response rate by respondent group and uh, the overall response rates for those five different groups that I just spoke of are, are highlighted in that red box and the right hand most column and that uh, those data are also depicted 
depicted graphically uh, below. And so you can see that the highest response rate um, came from faculty and uh, close to 50%, which is really great. And then if we look at the undergraduates, uh, both the Nat Sci majors and the other undergraduates that I just spoke of, uh, those response rates were uh, much lower in the 10 to 15% range. Um, but one thing we wanted to point out is that um, even though uh, the undergraduate response rate were the lowest percentage wise, nevertheless, if you look at the absolute numbers, the uh, NATSI undergraduates and other undergraduates make up the majority of the respondents. Uh, and uh, so we point that out um, just for you to keep in mind that um, for some of the survey items, um, if it that were common to all uh, five versions of the survey, uh, the results could be um, skewed by the sheer total number of undergraduates who responded. So just something to, to keep in mind. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about the uh, demographics of the respondents. Um, obviously not gonna go into all the numbers on the, the table they're there for you to um, take a look at in, um, uh, in, in depth if you like to, but I just want to draw your attention to the pie charts on the right that show you the breakdown of the demographic breakdown uh, by uh, gender in the top right, by um, sexual orientation and gender identity, or no, sorry, sexual orientation in the, the middle pie chart there. And then uh, the bottom pie chart shows you the breakdown, demographic breakdown of the respondents by race and ethnicity. The um, red box around the Middle Eastern, North African, American Indian, Native Alaskan, uh, or Alaska Native, excuse me, Hawaiian Pacific Islander, another and multiple. That's there to remind me to um, tell you that in some of the tables, when we look at um, survey results broken down by uh, race and ethnicity, we'll, there will be a category called other identity. And um, that other identity group includes those five groups that are in the red box there. The response rates um, were um, so low from those groups, or I'm sorry, not the response rates, but the the percentage of respondents um, were were low enough uh, for those five groups that really they needed to be grouped together to um, to uh, you, you know uh, make make any sense. So just to, uh, remember that other identities category includes those race and ethnic groups in the red. Next slide, please. So the climate survey itself um, uh, was conducted in conjunction with the, um, oh, I'm going to be blanking now on the official name of the office, but MSU survey office. Uh, they helped us to construct the um, uh, items and to do the analysis. And the, item, the survey items were um, uh, grouped together in three general categories. Uh, so there, the first uh, category of items were uh, an attempt to get a general assessment of uh, the climate and culture in NATSI uh, as perceived by the respondents. And the items there are related to um, uh, respondents' satisfaction and comfort, sense of belonging in the college. Uh, a second cluster of um, items was uh, around diversity and inclusion, and you can read there uh, the specific things that um, uh, were included in, in that cluster. And then finally, the a third cluster of items were around uh, bias incidents, uh, uh, sexual or general harassment, and uncivil behavior. So the way this is going to go, this presentation is going to go from here on out is that uh, Gabe is going to um, uh, show you the uh, results of the general assessments of uh, culture and climate. Uh, then he's going to hand it over to me for diversity and inclusion. And then I'll hand it back to Gabe um, for the third set. And then we'll wrap things up. So Gabe, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Cheryl. 
So again, the overall uh, evaluation and assessment uh, across the college, we want to talk about uh, satisfaction and comfort uh, by respondents overall uh, relative to total satisfaction. You'll see that across the board, I think we can look at these numbers and, and feel pretty good about that in general respondents overall feel relatively speaking totally sat or uh, have indicated total satisfaction. Uh, and also largely we see that folks in the College of Natural Science respondents indicate uh, high levels or high response rate for uh, total comfort level. Uh, as we move forward through the presentation, we want to draw your attention to these um, categorizations of total satisfaction is at, or total comfort is actually a combination from the way the survey was, was delivered. They've actually combined uh, those that are somewhat satisfied or very satisfied in uh, the total uh, likewise, for dissatisfaction or total uncomfort, uh, total dissatisfaction or uh, total uncomfortable is a combination of somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. So we'll keep track of that as we move forward. Um, again, same data represented in a, a different way. Uh, again, overall, at a glance, if you step back, it looks pretty good. People are satisfied. People are comfortable in the college. We do, though, want to draw our attention and we'll want to, uh, throughout the presentation, We'll want to drill down and talk about that which doesn't follow the trend and identify where there might be concerns. And we'll see uh, down here represented in uh, measurements of satisfaction. We've arbitrarily chosen 15%, uh, but uh, there were two groups for which came above or at that level. We see that faculty collectively have uh, indicated some uh, significant degree of total dissatisfaction. Likewise, graduate students have indicated a significant level of dissatisfaction. And those same two groups uh, relative to overall comfort, we'll see that faculty uh, and graduate students have indicated a high degree of total uncomfortable. Uh, in looking at uh, satisfaction comfort by race, ethnicity, and gender identity, uh, we wanna draw your attention to degrees of total uncomfortable. And, and identify again, drill down and identify where do we see uh, groups standing out as being significant. We would wanna draw your attention to that uh, the highest uh, area of concern we see here is respondents in black African-American and the other identities group have the highest degree of uncomfortable, closely followed by Hispanic Latinx. And then if we uh, bop over here and we'll see that the LGBT respondents for the, the survey are also indicating, uh, a, relatively speaking, a high degree of uncomfortable. Same data presented in an alternative fashion, uh, measurement of, of comfort uh, and identifying those who are uh, to a high degree indicating total uncomfortable. And we'll see again, Black African-American, Hispanic Latinx, that group categorizes other identities and LGBT are above that 15% threshold. In an attempt to measure sense of belonging, there were a series of questions that were posed to, uh, to respondents and they were somewhat different depending on the survey type. You'll see that some of these questions were asked only of students, uh, but included were advisors are concerned about my welfare. I have similar opportunities for success as others. Faculty negatively prejudice me. Faculty are concerned about my welfare and I have faculty role models. What we wanna identify is the, the group uh, where there's the greatest degree of concern or the, the lowest uh, positivity response rate is we see that black African-American respondents uh, respond across these questions uh, lower than, than all other respondent groups. And then considering uh, whether there are enough faculty staff that I identify with, and this is asked both of students and of all, uh, uh, all role types, including staff and faculty. We'll see again that Black African-American respondents indicated uh, significantly lower than any other group that uh, indicating that they do not agree with that, that notion. Same data presented in an alternative way. Uh, and I, I want to, again, we wanted to draw your attention to this concern that Black African-American respondents uh, uh, are disagreeing 
uh, in terms of that there are enough faculty staff that they identify with. In an attempt to measure sense of belonging, a series of questions were posed, uh, including safety within that psi, and 83% is a nice high number. Uh, so it suggests, oh, 83% of folks feel safe within that side, but that also means that there's a big cluster of folks that don't necessarily feel safe. Uh, that feels problematic to me. And then another series of questions that we might drill down in and, and, and look at, again, recognizing that some of these questions were posed only to students. Um, uh, I want to draw your attention to this one here, the asterisk, which was only asked of postdocs and graduate students. Uh, they've indicated, 72% uh, have indicated that they always or very often feel valued by their faculty, mentor, and committee members. This is Gabe's personal notion. I feel as though, boy, the relationships between postdocs and graduate students and their faculty mentors should be tight, and we would hope that those would be among the most supportive relationships, so I wish that was a higher number. Um, we see here, you belong in that size, 66% always or very often. I feel like that's a low number. We, we do need to recognize the possibility that the student respondents, the undergraduate student respondents, uh, which actually included a significant number of, of uh, integrative studies students, if they're asked, do you feel like a part of your, that you're part of that size, they might say no. So we have, we have to take this data uh, for what it's worth. Valued by advisors in that size, again, only, uh, undergrad students, uh, this feels a low number. Again, recognizing the, the somewhat confusing element of the undergrad respondents could confuse this a bit. Valued by other employees, valued by other students in the classroom. Valued by instructors in the classroom, whether they're a nat size student or not, I'd like to believe that all students in their classrooms feel valued. So I feel as though 57% is a, is a low number. So overall, uh, identifying factors that help employees to feel satisfied or comfortable, there were a series of items that were identified by the research group that conducted the survey. It includes believing that NatSci is supportive, respectful, welcoming, and non-sexist. It includes feeling that one belongs in that side and that one's personal identities are valued. It includes having similar opportunities for success as other people and believing that one has been treated fairly with respect to merit raised decisions. Similarly, for students uh, in an attempt to identify what factors help them to feel satisfied and comfortable, uh, they've indicated uh, feeling safe and a sense of belonging within that side, believing that that side is supportive, improving, non-racist, welcoming and respectful, and that uh, that size minimizing the extent to which they experience or witness incident of bias or discrimination. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl to talk about factors and issues related to diversity and inclusion. Okay, um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide then. So let me um, give you a little bit of context for this table. What we're looking at here are perceptions of faculty diversity by respondents or, or from respondents uh, by uh, broken down by race, uh, ethnicity, uh, gender identity, uh, and LGBT um, community status. And so um, just think about these um, items that you see. So the college has demonstrated a commitment to hiring diverse faculty. Within the college, there's a acceptable, acceptable amount of faculty diversity. Um, these are the perceptions of the various um, identity groups um, about faculty diversity. Um, so, uh, Gabe, if you could remind me. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And so, um, here we want to point out that the least um, favorable. Um, response rates in terms of perception of college commitment to hiring diverse faculty and an acceptable amount of faculty diversity, the, the lowest, uh, least favorable responses came from the Black and African American and Hispanic, Hispanic Latinx communities, um, both with respect to, yeah, both of those items. Um, and then again, if we look at gender identity, uh, women, um, 
had less favorable um, responses to those two items than men. And then uh, similarly with the LGBT community, um, uh, le less favorable responses in terms of their perception of faculty diversity than non-LGBT uh, community members. So one thing that stood out to us uh, sort of across the board when respondents were asked, okay, what areas um, do you think um, we, there's insufficient diversity? And you can see uh, they could respond race, ethnicity, gender, disability, and so on. Um, by far and away, um, race, uh, racial and ethnic uh, diversity were um, perceived as insufficient at really high rates across the board. So over 90% um, in, in each category of respondent, each identity group um, pointed to race and ethnicity as uh, problematic in terms of diversity within the college. Now this uh, table uh, is um, showing you perceptions of faculty diversity. There were also items uh, that asked about professions of uh, staff diversity and student diversity. We're not going to show you those tables because they are essentially indistinguishable, the numbers from um, the, these that you see here for uh, faculty diversity. So now we come to um, items that were attempting to assess fair treatment. Uh, these items were um, only asked of employees, so we don't have the student um, uh, confound here. Uh, and so the fair treatment items, I'll just give you a second to um, look down that um, left-hand column of what those items were, but they're basically, you know, do I feel like I'm being treated uh, fairly and, and are um, people in my unit uh, treated fairly or, and, and have I as an individual um, been treated fairly? And so what we wanted, what stuck, um, stood out to us in this particular uh, table um, are the, the data that um, came or the responses that came from the uh, Black African American, Hispanic Latinx, and other identities. Um, and I guess um, maybe we can go to the next slide because those numbers are, are shown here. So what was interesting to us was that if you just look at those three identity groups, um, the um, other identities and Hispanic Latinx identity groups uh, consistently uh, had less favorable responses than the Black and African American uh, respondents uh, across the board to these fair treatment items. Uh, we don't need to go back to the last, uh, the previous slide, but just point out that the um, the responses from the Black African American uh, identity uh, group uh, was not that different from the white and Asian groups. So that was interesting to us that within um, these historically underrepresented identity groups within STEM, there was there seemed to be a difference um, in in um, the their responses to this fair treatment items. And the next slide is a continuation of this. Uh, these uh, these items were separated. These three items were separated out because they are reverse coded. Um, me, but whether they were reverse coded or not, uh, just keep in mind that a lower uh, score is a less favorable response. And so again, um, uh, I perform more work than my to help students and colleagues and my colleagues do. Um, more burdened by university service responsibility. I feel like I've been treated differently in my unit. Again, the other identity groups and Hispanic Latinx groups uh, were consistently uh, gave less favorable responses to those items than the Black African American identity group. Now, this table is um, showing respondent perceptions of climate for diverse groups. And this in this table, it's broken down by respondent type. So your role in the college, so faculty through um, undergraduates. And so um, the, the way to think about this is if you just take um, 
uh, just looking at the faculty column, um, the, uh, the, what this is showing are faculty perceptions of the, what it would be like, what the climate would be like for white, for males, for tenure system, female, physical disability, so on and so forth. And um, one thing that was interesting to us is in this faculty column is that faculty perceptions of the climate uh, for either tenure system faculty or fixed term faculty, um, the per perception of the faculty is that the climate is not as good for fixed term faculty as it is for tenure stream faculty. But uh, we'll see in uh, a few slides down the line that um, that maybe is um, not, yeah, that, that may not be the case. Um, and we'll wait till, till we get there to, to point that out. And then um, the other uh, salient part of this table to us was that um, across respondent types, um, the perception um, was that the, the, the climate was least good, I guess is a way to say it, for um, folks with psychological or mental health issues. So that was the lowest um, uh, perceptions across the board again, as I said, and then we also wanted to note that the very, very lowest um, score uh, or least favorable perception come from graduate students' perceptions of the climate for those with psychological or mental health issues. We're highlighting this um, graduate student response here, not only because it is the lowest in this whole table, but that I think we'll see sort of a recurring theme uh, throughout uh, this presentation that um, um, we, we, there, there are several areas that, that we need to work on within the college to help improve the climate and culture for graduate students. And now I am turning it back over to Gabe for this uh, third section. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, the next series of slides are going to touch upon items from the survey that hope to get information relative to bias, harassment, and uncivil behavior. Uh, let's do this. So the first is uh, a series of questions. Uh, hope to, to get information about uh, a sense of respectful treatment uh, based by based on uh, race, ethnicity, gender, identity, for a series of questions, um, and uh, the folks that they're working with. And what we see here is uh, there's a across the board relative to respectful treatment. There's a, a lower or less favorable response rate for across all the groups relative to the contributions uh, in their units are feeling recognized and valued. Similarly, uh, a poor response relative to people in uh, their unit uh, caring about their general satisfaction. Those numbers are the absolute lowest for that group of, of uh, employees who fall into that other identities group. The next is a series of questions and items uh, looking at, uh, similarly uh, at respectful treatment, but this is by employee role. Uh, so faculty, fixed term faculty, specialist, uh, staff, postdoc, and also time in the position. And what we see is again, a, a similar uh, trend in the data where for both contributions being recognized and valued, and also uh, feeling as though people in our units care about our satisfaction, we see that the responses uh, in those categories are the lowest across the board for all employee roles. And we'll see that, um, faculty uh, have a, a low sense of feeling that their contributions are recognized and valued and uh, that people in their units uh, care about their satisfaction. What we have next is, is a series of uh, items which you're trying to determine by respondent type uh, uncivil behaviors that might be experienced from different groups that they would interact with. So you'll see feeling a uh, sense of feeling doubted or devalued 
uh, worker expertise put down or was kind of sending, distrusted description of own experiences or having made false statements or circulated rumors. So again, we're looking at the respondents and the interactions with the, the folks uh, across campus and with whom do they feel as though types of uncivil behaviors occur. And what we see is a trend across each group that within each respondent group, uh, each are more likely to report experiencing uncivil behavior from folks in their same group. Perhaps that's not surprising in that who do we spend most of our time with? We might think that faculty spend most of their time with faculty and students spend most of their time with students. So that's not perhaps surprising. Uh, we did want to, to draw your attention to that faculty also report at a quite high rate that they're feeling uncivil behaviors from students feeling doubted or devalued or put down by their students. Down here, a, a collective representation of uh, having experienced at least one behavior of, of uncivil behavior and uh, respondents are reporting across the board. Uh, the highest numbers appear to be that faculty uh, are, are identified as being those who are committing these acts of uncivil behavior. Uh, and it looks as though staff are the lowest. Uh, so they're the friendliest. And so we should all hang out with staff more often, it seems. Just saying. Uh, really want to emphasize this. And again, as Cheryl indicated, this, there's a trend across all of our, 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 our slides where graduate students are, are showing concerning responses in that 63% have indicated that they're feeling uncivil behaviors being committed by faculty. Next slide is, is we're shifting into issues related to sexual harassment. Um, and the, the items here include sexual harassment is a problem within the college. I know the steps to take if a person comes to me with a problem. Sexual harassment is taken seriously within the college. And I've experienced sexual harassment within the college. Uh, right off the bat, we want to draw your attention to that of all respondent types, 31% are indicating that sexual harassment is a problem within the college. That's a really high number uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and then we again wanted to draw your attention to some other strikingly concerning numbers within this graduate student group. We see the 45% uh, uh, respond total agreement that sexual harassment is a problem. And 24% um, disagree that sexual harassment is taken seriously within the college. And the highest across all groups is 11% of graduate students indicating a uh, total agreement that they have experienced sexual harassment within the college. These items have to do with uh, the college's response to sexual harass harassment uh, by, again, race, ethnicity, or gender identity. And the, the, the questions of the, uh, are sexual harassment a problem in the college? I know the steps to take if a person comes to me with a problem. Sexual harassment is taken seriously within the college and I have experienced sexual harassment in the college, but this, this time it's by race, ethnicity or gender identity. And uh, what we see here is a striking uh, difference uh, relative to having experienced sexual harassment between women and men, you'll see that the, the rate for women having experienced sexual harassment is more than double that that men are reporting. And for LGBT, it's again more than twice that being reported for non-LGBT groups, uh, respondents. And knowing the steps to take if a person comes to us with problem, we see that LGBT, uh, uh, a far higher degree are indicating total disagreement. Now they do not apparently know the steps uh, to take at a, at a far higher rate than non-LGBT. And then the concern, is sexual harassment taken seriously within the college? And as we look across this, uh, we'll see that, I think for me, the, the, the elements that stand out for me the most on this is that the female respondents at a far higher level are disagreeing that sexual harassment is taken seriously within the college compared to their male counterparts. Similarly, we see a very, the highest across the, the board that LGBT respondents are, are disagreeing that sexual harassment is taken seriously compared to their non-LGBT counterparts. Here we have sexual harassment items by respondent types, uh, employees, grad students, or undergraduate students. 
And again, drawing our attention to the graduate student concerns that Cheryl and I are, are repeatedly identifying. And we'll see that uh, those respondents when asked, I've experienced sexual harassment. We see that LGBT respondents at a far higher percentage uh, have indicated that they have actually experienced sexual harassment. And, uh, and also that this is true in both graduate students and undergraduates, but again, the graduate students uh, is to the highest degree. Uh, shifting into bias incidents and knowing how to report bias incidents and whether respondents feel as though they can report bias incidents without fear of retaliation. And if bias incidents are reported, do we believe that leadership will actually take appropriate response and action to address them? And we wanted to draw your attention to the totals uh, of how to, that we know how to report bias incidents if they occur. We'll see that 61% agree that they know how, but I think a striking 33% uh, don't uh, agree that they know how to report. And then again, drawing our attention to the, to the graduate students, we see 42% disagreeing that they know how to report. Um, and then a, a frightful number that 31% disagree that uh, they feel as though they can report bias incidents without fear of retaliation. And very concerning is that within the graduate student respondent group, 36% are disagreeing that uh, they believe leadership will take appropriate action to address issues of, of bias. This table, uh, or two tables actually, is representing uh, whether we have experienced or witnessed um, incidents of bias in the last year and then what that was based upon. So along the top, we've got respondent types and uh, along the, the side column, we see the types of bias incidents that might occur. And what we wanna point out is uh, having experienced these types of, of uh, bias incident, we see the faculty are reporting at the highest level that it's issues related to gender identity. Within graduate students, we see high uh, rates of reporting experiencing race, ethnicity uh, bias, gender identity, and psychological or mental health issues, and also country of origin. And then relative to having witnessed incidents of bias, we see faculty having witnessed at high levels, uh, issues relative to race, ethnicity, and gender identity, whereas graduate students at the highest rate are reporting issues of uh, related to race, ethnicity, gender identity, and again, psychological or mental health issues and country of origin. And across the board, we see having witnessed issues of bias uh, the largest group across the board is we are all witnessing issues relative to racial uh, and ethnic uh, biases. Uh, to emphasize uh, much of what was contained in the last several slides, we see that, uh, emphasizing again, the graduate students are witnessing bias incidents at, at a far higher percentage than all other groups. Table 66 uh, is an indication of the prevalence of bias incidents by race, ethnicity, or uh, and gender identity. So again, to the left, we have experienced um, issues of, of bias, and to the right, we have witnessed issues of bias. Uh, across our, our, our race, ethnicity groups, what we see is across the board, we're seeing a higher percentage of bias incidents reported relative to uh, race and ethnicity. And uh, the same is true relative to having witnessed issues of race and uh, Ethnic, ethnic bias. And we see that the LGBT community respondents are reporting far higher uh, level, uh, having witnessed um, issues of bias. And across the board at the bottom, the question being, have we ever experienced or ever witnessed? Uh, and I, uh, we want to emphasize that Apparently, there's a lot of folks experiencing and a lot of folks witnessing issues of bias uh, within the College of Natural Science, and this needs to be addressed. And uh, the prevalence, again, uh, represented in an alternative way. Now, the prevalence for experiencing and witnessing bias incidents, we see that the Black African American respondent group, the uh, Hispanic Latinx, and the other identities group are by far um, witnessing and experiencing um, issues of biases at higher rates 
than other respondent groups. Um, for Gabe, uh, with this slide, what I would like, what I'm going to choose to point out with this slide is uh, there is a prevalence of, there is a significant, for my opinion, a significant degree of bias being reported and witnessed. Um, this 20% again, arbitrarily chosen. Uh, it does actually exclude a group, uh, which I am a member of, uh, white men uh, at the very lowest degree uh, are experiencing issues of, of bias incidents. Uh, I just draw that to our attention. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl to identify and allow us to dismount and shift into question and answer uh, section. Right, so this slide is just um, sort of a, a summary of the, the key points that uh, we've taken away from um, what, what you've heard today uh, and, and areas that at the college level, we um, are certainly in need of improvement and want to address. So the first one is the level of diversity among our community members, especially in terms of race and ethnicity. The prevalence of uncivil behavior and bias incidents that Gabe just went over, um, and especially those committed by faculty toward other employees and graduate students, and those committed by undergraduate students toward other undergraduates, those these prevalence rates that that were reported are um, they're just not acceptable and and uh, are very concerning, and and we want to address that. Um, the other thing that stands out, uh, particularly uh, to me, is um, that people don't, many, many people, at least half, um, do not feel that their contributions are valued, and this is a big concern. And then finally, as we've mentioned a couple times, uh, graduate students are less likely to believe that sexual harassment is taken seriously by the college and that appropriate action will be taken if it is um, reported, and they are more likely to fear retaliation and to experience sexual harassment and bias incidents. And then um, underrepresented racial and ethnic identity groups, uh, women and members of the LGBT community are more likely to feel uncomfortable in the college and to experience and witness bias incidents. So these are areas of most concern to us. And then lastly, as I mentioned uh, at the first slide, there are unit level data for units to take a look at, reflect on, and uh, um, think about. And um, uh, Amber Benton, our semi-recently appointed uh, assistant dean for DEI in the college, has asked um, all units to identify based on um, uh, either the unit level data or just discussions within the unit themselves identify at least one goal um, that they can work on over the next couple of years um, in term the, and that goal would be um, how can we what what one thing can we do that would help improve the climate and culture within our unit and um, in addition to just stating the goal to include um, how the unit's going to hold itself accountable for achieving that goal and, and how they'll know whether they've achieved the goal, that goal. So what are the metrics? And there is a Qualtrics form that Amber has set up. It's, I think it's two items, which is what's your goal and how are you, you, know, what, how are you gonna know if you're successful? Uh, and so a link to that Qualtrics form is there and um, uh, John and Gabe as directors of BioSci and CISGS um, have that um, already, and um, we'll be working with um, you all to um, identify that goal. 